Tag TV brings you daily news bulletin from India. Breaking news and views from India. Good evening, welcome to South Asia Newsline. I'm Lepakshi Kurana. Here are the top stories we're tracking for you. Indian Prime Minister Modi campaigns in poll bound Gujarat state. COP27 agrees to set up loss and damage fund. Pakistan PM calls it pivotal step. And low voter turnout, rise of independence likely to change Nepal political landscape. And now for all the details, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi on Monday held a series of rallies as he campaigned for his ruling Bharatiya Janata Party in poll-bound Gujarat state. Elections for the 182-member Gujarat Assembly will be held in two phases on December 1st and 5th. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi on Monday sharpened his attack on the opposition Congress party as he held a total of three rallies in Gujarat state in the run-up to the polls next month, saying its cross-country March Bharat Jodo Yatra against hate and division is only for power. He accused Congress of calling him names and said the Congress now has to move on and discuss his ruling BJP's development efforts in Gujarat over the past two decades. The Hindu nationalist Bharatiya Janata Party BJP has been in power in Gujarat since 1998 and Modi served as its chief minister for nearly 13 years before becoming the prime minister in 2014. Modi remains popular despite criticism of inflation and unemployment. The vote is likely to offer a clue to his party's prospects in a general election due by 2024. Apart from Congress, the other main contender is the Aam Admi Party. Meanwhile, Congress leader Rahul Gandhi also held a poll rally in Gujarat, Surat and raised the issue of growing unemployment in the state and problems faced by farmers, youth and tribals. Recalling Mahatma Gandhi's salt march, he said his Bharat Jodo Yatra has a strong connection with Gujarat's history and culture. The Gujarat Assembly polls will be held in two phases on December 1 and 5. Votes will be counted on December 8. In the last state election five years ago, the BJP won 99 seats, while the main opposition Congress ended up with 77. The UN Climate Summit COP27 adopted the agreement on creating loss and damage fund for developing countries suffering climatic disasters on Sunday. The agreement was added in the final text after tense negotiations exceeding the schedule by two days. Pakistan, which suffered devastating floods in September, welcomed the agreement and has called it a pivotal step. Pakistan on Sunday welcomed the adoption of tax provision in COP27 to set up loss and damage fund to help developing countries battered by climate disasters. Appreciating the step, Pakistan's Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif called it the first pivotal step towards the goal of climate justice. The setup of fund had dominated the two-week summit at Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt. The South Asian nation's climate minister and envoy at COP27, Sherry Rahman, praised the final deal saying the loss and damage fund was a down payment for joint futures and investment in climate justice. The setup of fund comes amid Pakistan being on financial crunch after getting struck by the devastating monsoon floods that left nearly a third of the country underwater, affecting some 33 million people and killing nearly 1,700. For 30 years on this path and today in Sharm el Shakh, this journey has achieved its first positive milestone. The establishment of a fund is not about dispensing charity. It is clearly a down payment on the longer investment in our joint futures. It is a down payment and an investment in climate justice. However, COP26 President Alok Sharma gave a critical comment over the final text and said the goal of limiting the temperature rise to 1.5 degree under the Paris Agreement remains on life support. While the COP27 summit was expected to be an action summit to implement the agreements of the last summit, 
the loss and damage deal could become significant development since the Paris Agreement. Moving on, a shocking report has revealed that there has been a sharp rise in the wealth of close family members of Pakistan Army Chief General Kamar Javed Bajwa in a span of six years. This comes as his tenure is set to end in about a week. Less than a week before Pakistan Army Chief Kamar Javed Bajwa's tenure is about to end, a shocking report has shed light on the sharp rise of wealth of close family members of the most powerful person in the country in a span of six years. In a report on Fact Focus portal, Pakistani journalist Ahmed Nurani has unearthed how Bajwa's immediate and extended family members, in a matter of few years, started a new business, became owners of farmhouses in prominent Pakistani cities and bought foreign properties, making billions of dollars in the process. The report noted how between 2013 and 2017, Bajwa revised the wealth statement for 2013 three times after being appointed the country's army chief. This comes as the process for the appointment of a new army chief was likely to be completed this week. Meanwhile, opposition PTI party vice chairman Shah Mehmood Qureshi said on Sunday that President Arif Alvi will not stop the summary for the appointment of a new army chief. He added that former Prime Minister Imran Khan has also clarified that the PTI party has neither any favourite nor objection to the appointment of any person as the army chief. The office of the chief of army staff has held importance for a very long time making the appointment an important issue for political parties. The military has directly ruled the country for almost half of Pakistan's nearly 75-year history. Even during the civilian rule, it dominates security and foreign policy. In news from Nepal, political analysts have said the low voter turnout of 61% during Sunday's election in Nepal and the rise of independence are expected to change the political landscape of the country. The poll body has said that it could take up to two weeks to declare the final results. Nepal witnessed a low voter turnout of 61% of the country's 18 million eligible voters during Sunday's election, down from the 68% seen at the last election in 2017. Chief Election Commissioner Dinesh Thapalia said, it is less than our expectations. The voting remained largely peaceful, however one person was killed in a clash, he said. It could take up to two weeks to declare final results, Thapalia added. On Monday, as the counting of votes was underway, initial results signaled many new faces taking on the front. There were no pre-election polls, though political analysts had earlier said they expected the ruling alliance of the Nepali Congress and some former Maoist rebels to retain power. राजनीतिक दौलत ले संविधान निर्माण भाई से कि पश्चिम बाहे को पहलो आम निर्वासन पश्चिम बने को सरकार ले सोचे अनुसार को काम करना नशक दा जनता में एक किस्म को वित्रिष्णा र नई राष्ट्रता देखियो तीस को प्रतिबिंब को रूप में तीस को प्रतिशोत को रूप में विद्रोह को रूप में स्वतंत्र उम्मीदवार हरू अली बड़ी देखिए कासन र मतदान को प्रक्रिया बात हमेंले हैरचों बने हैरियों बने मतदान अली स्वतंत्र को बंदा कम मतदान भाइयों को देखिए कुछ आप पॉलिटिकल स्टेबिलिटी हैज प्रूवन इल्यूजिव फॉर द हिमालयन नेशन वेज्ड बिटवीन चाइना एंड इंडिया डिस्करेजिंग मेनी इन्वेस्टर्स नेपाल हैज हैड टेन गवर्नमेंट्स सिंस द अबोलिशन ऑ a new government will face the challenge of reviving the economy and curbing high prices at a time of fears that a global recession might reduce remittances, which account for about a quarter of gross domestic product. Tourism, which contributed 4% to GDP before the pandemic, has yet to fully recover. Well, in news from Bangladesh, a red alert has been sounded across Bangladesh to nab two Islamist militants who escaped from a crowded court in capital Dhaka on Sunday. The two were on death row for the 2015 killing of a U.S. blogger critical of religious extremism. Two Islamist militants sentenced to death for killing a U.S. blogger critical of religious extremism escaped from a crowded court in Bangladesh's Dhaka on Sunday. 
Avijit Roy, an engineer of Bangladeshi origin, was hacked to death by Mashit Wilding Asylums in February 2015 while returning home with his wife from a Dhaka book fair. His wife, blogger Rafida Bonia Ahmed, suffered head injuries and lost a thumb in the attack. Five members of an Islamist militant group were sentenced to death last year, while one was jailed for life. Two of those on death penalty escaped on Sunday after bikers sprayed chemical on the police before snatching away the convicts, police said. A massive manhunt has been launched, Home Minister Asaduzzaman Khan told reporters, adding that border forces had also been put on alert. Police has announced an award of $19,350 for tracing the convicts who belong to the Al-Qaeda-inspired domestic militant group Ansar Ullah Bangla team. Police says the group was behind the murders of more than a dozen secular activists and bloggers. Muslim-majority Bangladesh saw a string of deadly attacks between 2013 and 16, targeting bloggers, secular activists and religious minorities, claimed by Islamic State or Al-Qaeda-aligned groups. Moving on, the Controversial Prevention of Terrorism Act of Sri Lanka will soon be replaced with a new law, the Island Nations Justice Minister has said. This comes amid protests by student organizations to demand the release of the leaders detained under the Dekronian law. Sri Lanka's Justice Minister Vijay Dasa Rajapakshe has said the government is willing to repeal the Controversial Prevention of Terrorism Act, PTA, as the process of drafting a new law is currently under process, local media reports suggest. Rajapakshe added that an anti-terrorism law is necessary to ensure the protection of national security. The existing Anti-Terrorism Act, PTA, was introduced on temporary basis in 1979 to tackle the rise of separatist group LTTE. In 2019, the government tried to replace the controversial act, but after the Gotabaya Rajapaksa took charge as president, government withdrew the draft Counterterrorism Act, citing the views of various stakeholders and lack of consensus on the text. The minister's remarks came after Colombo witnessed protests demanding the release of two student leaders detained under the existing anti-terrorism law. The two leaders who were leading the protest against President Rajapaksa were detained in August and faced further detention when his successor Ranil Vikrame Singhe assumed the office. Human rights watchdog Amnesty International condemning the detention has asked for release of student leaders and demanded the repeal of PTA. International human rights activists and Tamil parties have long dubbed PTA as a draconian law. They claim that the act has been used for over 40 years to enable prolonged arbitrary detention extract false confessions through torture and target minority communities and political dissidents in Sri Lanka. With the beginning of the FIFA World Cup in Qatar, football fever has gripped fans across India. Renowned artist Sudarshan Patnaik has made an eight-foot-tall sand art depicting the FIFA World Cup trophy in the beach town of Puri, while some people in Kerala state have painted their houses in the colours of their favourite teams. Take a look. As the 2022 FIFA World Cup kicked off in Qatar on Sunday, football fever has gripped Indians for the first football World Cup taking place after the COVID-19 pandemic. Renowned sand artist Sudarshan Patnaik has created an 8-foot tall sand art depicting the FIFA World Cup trophy in the beach town of Puri. The fervour of the game also reached fans in India's southern Kerala who have bought a house and painted it in the colours of Brazil, Argentina and Portugal where they say they will gather and watch the matches. The house was collectively bought by 17 people for nearly 28,200 US dollars, especially to watch the matches. Got a big screen here, not big screen, big uh, TV here. So we will uh, uh, make an arrangement like that. Uh, everybody can sit here, by, uh, youngsters also, and senior senior people also. Everybody, this whole uh, generation can come here. Meanwhile, in Goa, many restaurants decked up to welcome customers to dine and enjoy the matches. Many youngsters were seen getting up early to enjoy late night games. Acha experience hai. Ek Goa mein kafi acha hai. Me iske pehle DTR gaya tha, Suho bhi gaya tha. Wahan par itna thik thak tha, log zyada music wagar laga lete. Yahan par kafi local vibe hai. Bahut hi acha hai. Bahut log baat wagar karte hai. Abhi Goa mein matlab Goa aisa jagah hai ki matlab ekdam local local football mein bhi kafi roots pada hai na football ka. 
तो यहाँ पर लोगों को बहुत जानकारी है फुटबॉल के बारे में तो उनके साथ बात करने को बहुत अच्छा लगता है दी वर्ल्ड कप विच इज ऑर्गेनाइज वंस एवरी फोर इयर्स बाय फीफा इज बींग होस्टेड बाय कतर अंटिल दिसंबर एटीन दो इंडिया क्वालिफाइड इन नाइनटीन फिफ्टी दे हैव नेवर एक्चुअली मेड इट टू दी वर्ल्ड कप बट एवरी टाइम द इवेंट इज हेल्ड इंडिया फुटबॉल फैंस डू क्रेजी थिंग्स टू एक्सप्रेस देर लव फॉर दी स्पोर्ट एंड देर फेवरेट इंटरनेशनल टीम्स Well that's all we have for you from South Asia this evening. Now our viewers can watch the show on southasianewsline.com. You can also visit us on facebook.com/sasianewsline and follow us on Twitter at @sasianewsline. That's all in tonight's edition. We'll see you same time tomorrow. Good night. Tag TV brings you daily news bulletin from India. breaking news and views from india